Good morning. My name is Marie Rienzo, and I want to welcome you to the NIH Office of Disease Prevention's Mind the Gap webinar series. This series explores research design, measurement, intervention, data analysis, and other methods of interest to prevention science. Our goal is to engage the prevention research community in thought-provoking discussions, to promote the use of the best available methods, and to support the development of better methods. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping items. To submit questions during the webinar, there are two options. First, you may submit questions via WebEx by clicking on the question mark in the WebEx toolbar. Please direct your questions to all panelists. Second, you may participate by Twitter and submit questions using the hashtag NIHMTG. At the conclusion of today's talk, we will open the floor to questions that have been submitted via WebEx and Twitter. Lastly, we would appreciate your feedback about today's webinar. Upon closing the WebEx meeting, you will be directed to a website to complete an evaluation. We would appreciate your feedback as it will help us improve this webinar series. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. David M. Murray, Associate Director for Prevention and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. Thank you, Marie. Today's speaker is Dr. Jennifer Croswell, a Senior Program Officer at the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. She provides oversight for a legislatively mandated evidence synthesis program, which aims to increase the quantity and quality of available comparative effectiveness research while supporting novel data analytic techniques to address key research gaps. Before joining PCORI, Dr. Croswell was a medical officer at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. There, she provided scientific and technical support for the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, an independent group of experts in evidence-based medicine and prevention who make recommendations for primary care clinicians. Prior to that, uh, she served as acting director of the NIH's Office of Medical Applications of Research, home to the former NIH Consensus Development Program, which produced evidence-based assessments of controversial medical issues and developed roadmaps of critical evidence gaps. So she has a great deal of uh, experience with systematic reviews, uh, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Croswell uh, to our webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray, and welcome to everyone. So uh, before we get started talking about the real meat of uh, today's talk, which is really to help people give you some tools as to um, sorting through systematic reviews and understanding how to differentiate quality among them, I thought it might be useful to provide some context for people uh, about sort of how systematic reviews uh, developed, or just a little bit of background, and it's a very superficial background, so, but even, even giving you a superficial background I thought still might be helpful to sort of help you understand how they kind of came to be. So taking a look at this slide, what this is trying to show you, it's taking a look at PubMed and all the randomized controlled trials that have been published in PubMed annually between 1960 and 2014. And in a nutshell, what this is showing you is that there's been, over time, just an exponential growth in this type of evidence. And theoretically speaking, um, this is supposed to be the kind of evidence that a clinician, for example, could start to draw causal inferences from to say there's interventions that I might want to change my clinical practice about. That said, you can see with this, this exponential growth, there's a lot going on here, and it's going to be very difficult for any one person to assimilate all of this information successfully and be able to use it in any sort of um, reasonable sort of way. This is just nobody's going to be able to drink the ocean, right? And this is not a, a new thing that I, that I a, new, a new conclusion that I'm drawing. Uh, and we had two authors before that in the BMJ in 2010 kind of drawing the same conclusion. And so there was a study that was called On the Impossibility of Being Expert. And so basically what this did is it, it, it's a thought experiment, and it's a little bit extreme, but what they did was they said, let's try and say for any um, new clinician, how much time would it take for them to sort of come up to speed with all the medical literature in their field? Uh, and so for this one, what they did is they took a, they took, say, a new cardiologist, and they said, if they wanted to read all the literature that came before her and then stay abreast of stuff specifically in her field, in this case, one slice of it, so it's cardiac diagnostic imaging, so one tiny piece of it. And they said, well, let's say she could read five papers an hour for eight hours a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year. So again, this is quite extreme. It's, it's, it's you know, theoretical. But they said, you know, it's going to take her 12 years 
just to come to the point where she was there, all the stuff in the past. And during that time, there's been 82,000 additional papers being published, right? And so they were like, well, if, it, if, if she wants to be current to the point where she's just sort of keeping a pace with what's being published from that point forward, she'd actually have to you know, go through her whole clinical career and retire. So again, what this is saying is that nobody, nobody can really become an expert in what's happening in their clinical field. And it's not, just, it's not just clinicians, it's public health experts, it's policy people. We need help trying to figure out how we're going to take this mass of evidence and interpret it and synthesize it in a meaningful way. And so traditionally, what happened was the narrative review. And this is not to denigrate the narrative review in any way. They're still done, and there's, there's definitely a time and a place for them. But what that really was, typically, was a smart guy in a room, and it, it often was a guy in the past, and, and they would basically use their expert opinion, their expertise, their intuition, their experience, and they would pull together what they knew from the field as being things that shaped the way clinical practice was moving. And that's what they would use to sort of say, here's what I know about this, and, and here's what you should know about it. And while that was very useful, it's better than that whole mass of information being thrown at you and you left this sort of to your own devices to try to figure out what's important, people started to realize that that had its own limitations. And so new methodologies began to be developed, and one of those was the systematic review. And so looking, trying to compare the two of these, the systematic review versus the narrative review, you can see that there's some clear differences between the two of them. Now, like I said, this is a very simplistic way to try to talk about how the systematic reviews come to be developed, because there are multiple other advantages and reasons why they sort of came into being. But it's just to sort of put this into context a little bit. And so one of the differences between systematic reviews and narrative reviews has to do with the research question itself. So a narrative view often would just have um, a sort of general approach to it, right? You might say, just kind of taking a preventive question, for example, you'd say something like, what's the best method to screen somebody for breast cancer? Or does, does it work even? Does breast cancer screening work? In a systematic review, you can't set up a question like that. You cannot go to the literature and ask it in that way. You can't pull things based on that kind of construction. Instead, in a systematic review, it has to be very focused and specific in order to actually get studies back to address it. So it would be something more like, what is the effectiveness of mammography screening on breast cancer-specific mortality or morbidity, for example? So it's a very different framing of a clinical question that points you to a certain kind of an answer. The sources and the search strategy will also be presented in a very different way. In a narrative review, it's not usually specified because it's often just kind of coming from the brain of the person who's writing the review. So it's, it's not a terribly specific process. And when it says it may be biased, what we mean by that is it's often not comprehensive in the way that a systematic review is, in the sense that there is an, a transparent and an explicit search strategy that's being used in that case. And it's often searching multiple bases and really pulling in what's, what's hopefully going to be comprehensive. The study selection process is different between a systematic review and a narrative review in that in a systematic review, it's going to be criterion-based. You're going to know what those are ahead of time. They're going to be explicit, and they're going to be uniformly applied. Whereas in a narrative review, that's generally not the case. You're not going to have these things that are specified, and they're not going to be across the board saying, does this fit, does it not fit, and you're going to have a weeding out. That's not really what's done in a narrative review. The study appraisal is going to be different as well. So in a systematic review, what we mean by that is there's going to be a tool, typically, that's being used where they're going to be taking the study, looking at it for specific metrics of quality according to standardized criteria. And in a narrative review, they may talk about whether they thought a study was good or bad according to certain parameters, but often that will vary across the different studies they're looking at, and it may not be explicit or uniform across them as well. And then finally, this point about synthesis. In a systematic review, you will have qualitative synthesis, and in a narrative review, you may have that as well. But systematic reviews can go beyond that, and they can do things that are quantitative. So meta-analyses, for example, which doesn't typically happen in a narrative review because the methods aren't there to support that. So a little bit more information about systematic reviews before we start talking about how you better assess them. Systematic reviews try to collate all the empiric evidence, fitting pre-specified eligibility criteria to answer those specific research questions. So they're explicit, they're systematic, and really their intent is to help minimize bias with the hopes of making them reliable. 
So there's necessary elements that go into a systematic review. They're clearly stated. They have explicit objectives. So you can think about it in sort of a parallel way that we would think about doing a randomized controlled trial in a sense, right? So it's almost like setting up a protocol for that. You're going to have predefined research questions. You're going to have eligibility criteria for studies. And you'll have a systematic, this is a little bit different because you don't do this in a randomized controlled trial, but you have a systematic search strategy. So you want to set that up the same way that you would set up the protocol. You'll have a transparent and reproducible methodology. You're going to systematically present the characteristics and the findings of those studies that get included versus those that get excluded. Um, and again, importantly, what you want to do for both the individual studies that make it into the review and for the overall body of the evidence, you want to assess the quality. And you want to do that in a transparent and explicit way. So now this figure is going to look a little bit familiar to what I already showed you before for the randomized controlled trials. What this is doing is looking at PubMed. And now it's looking at systematic reviews and meta-analyses that got published in PubMed annually. You can see there's a time lag that happened here. This is now 1986 up to 2014. But it's a strikingly similar curve that we're seeing. And this is yearly publications. And we see that similar exponential increase over time. There's a 2,000% increase over time. So what's going on? Seeming to be some parallels here. So um, I just told you one of the fundamental reasons that systematic reviews came into being was because we didn't want to drink the ocean, and yet we have now reproduced the ocean. This can be problematic because you can imagine if you've got thousands and thousands of systematic reviews getting produced every year, there might be some repetition of systematic reviews on a specific topic. And if that's true, repetition of specific reviews can be good, just like it can be good to do randomized controlled trials multiple times on the same topic because reproducibility is important. But when you don't have reproduced results, when you get conflicting results, then we start to get into problems. And that's exactly what we start to see with systematic reviews. Here's the, here's the first example of this. So John Ioannidis did this look. We took, looked at um, comparative effectiveness systematic reviews of antidepressants. And here's what he found. So in the first meta-analysis, um, when they did this comparative effectiveness review, paroxetine seemed to be the most favorable and fluoxetine and bupropion were down at the bottom. Um, for the second one, they seem to all be in the middle. And then down at the third one, you can see now we've seen an inverse classification of these. So fluoxetine is now at the top, and paroxetine is, and, uh, is down at the bottom. This is really confusing. When systematic reviews are supposed to be done according to explicit and transparent methods, it seems sort of hard to imagine why it is now that we're coming up with diametrically um, opposed conclusions. Second of these, so now we're looking at meta-analyses and orthopedic surgery. So this first example is looking at graft choice and ACL reconstruction. So we have two different surgical methods. You've got favoring hamstring tendons versus favoring a bone tendon bone and neutral. This almost looks like a random distribution across these seven meta-analyses, up, down, and in the middle there, and hyaluronic acid for knee osteoarthritis favorable versus unfavorable and neutral, again, up, down, and in the middle. So it, there's really not a, a lot of consistency across these meta-analyses. Third example, this one is almost particularly egregious, and it's um, pretty suitable for the Office of Disease Prevention, because here we're talking about a, a screening intervention. So these are systematic reviews of the net benefit of mammography for breast cancer screening. There have been 50, at least in this review, this is what they found, 50 systematic reviews of breast cancer screening mammography conducted between the years of 2000 and 2015. And I'll just point out that there's been observational studies conducted as well. So you can imagine that um, there can be reasons to, to do multiple ones. So there's more evidence than, than what I'm showing here. But there's really only been eight randomized controlled trials that have been done that have evaluated the efficacy of conventional mammography on breast cancer mortality. And they're old, again. so. That there may be reasons to, to, to need to bring in observational evidence and, and do multiple systematic reviews. But again, when there's eight um, primary trials you know, that, 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 that can show you sort of the causal evidence, and you have 50 systematic reviews, it starts to approach a level of a little bit of ludicrousy that's far beyond sort of replication. And, and it sort of shows you, because it, it does get you the point of saying, this is kind of mass confusion in terms of what are we supposed to do. If you look at this figure, it's showing the number of conclusions by publication years 
and the favorable ones in orange versus the non-favorable in the, in the greenish color. And it's just all over the map. Very difficult to know what it is we're supposed to draw from all of this when, when in theory, the point of a systematic review is supposed to be that it's you know, doing something explicitly, transparently, and helping you come to a conclusion about the whole body of evidence. You look at this and you sort of feel like, I don't know which direction to turn in. So what are we supposed to do? Well, there's some good news in all of this, and that is that, that there, there are things that we know we should be looking for. And um, so the Institute of Medicine in 2011 actually put out a report on this, and what they did is they, they came up with some standards for systematic reviews. And the standards cover all aspects of covering, conducting, I'm sorry, a systematic evidence review. So that includes initiating the review, finding and assessing the studies for inclusion in the report, synthesizing the body of the evidence, and reporting on the review. So we have, we have some signposts and some, and some guidance that we can look to when we're reading our evidence review to know, did they do the right thing or did they not? Okay, so there are a lot of standards in that report, and I put it in the references that are going to be up on the ODP website, so you can take a look at that. What I'm doing here is I'm trying to pull out some highlights for you that, you, that I think are really some of the, the, the meat of what would be important for you to sort of say, did they hit that? Okay, good. Did they hit that? Okay, good. Because if they didn't, I would consider that a, a flag. So on this, this first slide, this is about the initiating. What this is really sort of honing in on is, is the kind of talking about, for the people conducting the review itself, is there anything about the composition of the review team that you should be potentially concerned about? And so these first standards are really about how do they manage potential biases or conflicts of interest in the review team. So in this first one, they're talking about financial conflicts of interest and intellectual conflicts of interest and that they should disclose them, or in some cases, that people with those kinds of conflicts should be excluded altogether from participating as key members of the review team. And so when we talk about intellectual conflicts of interest, that can be a little squishy for some people to sort of say, well, what does that mean? So one example of what we might be talking about there would be if you were, for example, an investigator who had a trial that might end up in the systematic review itself, you could see how somebody there might have a preformed opinion about what the results of the systematic review could be. That could be a potential intellectual conflict of interest. And so what the IOM is saying here is, um, for one thing, you should disclose it. And for another thing, they might actually say that person should not be a person on the review team who is either going through and abstracting studies to say, should this study make it into the review or not, you know, applying the inclusion or exclusion criteria. And maybe that person shouldn't be the person actually writing up the review and drawing conclusions from it. That's not to say that they shouldn't have any input to the review itself. So there are ways that, and that's what the second bullet point down at the bottom is talking about, which is ensuring user and stakeholder input. So they're saying that people who have clinical expertise are actually really important to a systematic evidence review because you don't want a clinically naive product. And so there are places where, where input is important to have there, like public comment, um, things like that. So, so it's not like you're trying to totally exclude expertise. But there are places within the review where it might be important to put up what you might call firewalls, so that objectivity to the extent possible is maximized. And so here is an example, getting back to that breast cancer screening paper we were talking about, that sort of shows, and this is not to say, um, I don't want to comment here about, this is not supposed to sort of devolve into whether I think mammography screening works or doesn't work, so I just want to make that clear. But this is just sort of to show a point of when you have these standards not being met, does it have an effect on the outcome of systematic review? And I want to show you case examples where it appears to have an association. So this is one of these examples. So here's an association of financial and intellectual conflict of interest with outcomes of the systematic review. And this is the one, so looking at those 50 systematic reviews of mammography screening and breast cancer effective, breast cancer screening uh, effectiveness for, for breast cancer mortality, for example, okay? So here's what they found. They looked at all of those systematic reviews and they said, was it, did the conclusion, was it favorable? So saying that mammography screening works or it doesn't work. So across all of them, 42% 42 42 of them says, yes, mammography screening worked in a certain population of women. Now, if you split that out and said, okay, well, 
of the ones that potentially had what they would say, maybe that's an intellectual, con uh, intellectual bias or conflict of interest, so they were a clinician. So let's say they were a radiologist or a breast cancer surgeon. Now you can see what happens to the number of favorable conclusions, and it jumps up to 63% of those systematic reviews. Whereas for the, for the authors where they were sort of what you'd call a pure methodologist, so let's say an epidemiologist or a statistician, it drops down to only 32% of those reviews coming to a favorable conclusion. So something changed just by the nature of who the authors were. Now they split it out again and said, well, let's look at financial conflicts of interest. So looking up at the clinicians, for those clinician groups that disclose a financial conflict of interest, now it bumps up again. Now you've got 71% of those reviews coming to a, a favorable or positive conclusion. Looking down at the non-clinicians, for the one review where there was an associated financial conflict of interest, there was only one, but of it, now it's, it's flipped and it's become a favorable conclusion. So again, not saying anything about whether mammography works. And I'm not also saying that when you're looking at these things and you're looking at the author list and you're looking at the conflict of interest disclosures, that it means that you should pick up the review and throw it away. That's unsubtle and that's not the point. What the point is here, though, is just to be aware that these associations can have an effect on a conclusion. So it's a marker for you. It's one thing on your checklist that you should just be taking a look at when you have two reviews or more with discordant conclusions, you should look at it and say, that may be one reason for the discordant conclusion, and I'm going to keep it in mind and put it in context with all the other things I'm checking off on my list. Okay, so here are some more standards on the initiating part. And so the next ones around these have to do with sort of what are we setting up for our framework for our systematic review. And so they talk about developing an analytic framework, and then talk about what should go into the protocol for the systematic review. Again, so think about it analogously to think about developing the protocol or setting up your clinical trial, because it should be the same thing. Things should be pre-specified, transparent, and accessible. So there should be study inclusion and exclusion criteria that you can find. They should be clearly stating what their outcome measures, their time points, interventions, and comparison groups are. They should be talking about the search strategy that they're using. They should probably be looking at more than one database. If, if, if the systematic evidence review is supposed to be comprehensive, you want to make sure they looked in all the right places. They need to describe how they were critically appraising the quality of each individual study that ends up in the review. And then as well, how are they determining the quality of the overall body of evidence, that, that synthesis that they're doing? And then finally, this is also analogous to what you do with clinical trials now, like on clinicaltrials.gov. You should make sure that their final protocol was publicly available. And so I have this EG publish it on Prospero. So I'm going to show you this. There's a place that you can go to now. There's a website where you can, let's see if they can do it. Here we go. Um, you can register your systematic reviews ahead of time. So this is what it looks like. This is part of the National Health Service, your international perspective register of systematic reviews. And there you go. See, it says register your review and search. You can search for anyone that's up there and see if it was there pre-specified and if there's any changes that they made to it along the way. Okay. Okay, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we actually could, but I just want to show you what an analytic framework is. You may not find this in every systematic review, but it's a good thing when you do find it. So what it is is a sort of a logical thought model, and it helps you to sort of see visually for all of the research questions that are being asked of the systematic review how do they all fit together and does it make sense? And so this was really developed by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Um, and it helps you just, like I said, it, 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 it's, a, it's a logic chain that helps you sort of think through the problem as you're doing a systematic review. And this one, again, sort of to try to keep this going, this is the one that they did for breast cancer screening and mammography. Okay. This next thing is talking about in your protocol, we, we, I mentioned this PCOATS criteria before, and this is sort of setting up your inclusion and exclusion criteria. And I, I hate the mnemonic PCOATS because a mnemonic is typically supposed to help you remember something and a PCOATS doesn't actually stand for anything, but there it is, we're stuck with it. So PCOATS stands for Population, Interventions, Comparisons, Outcomes, Timing, and sometimes people we use the S for Settings. And so there you go, it's, it's all the granular interventions, I'm sorry, information that you would need to know to sort of put context around what you're actually going to be studying. So I'll give you one example here. Again, this is, a, this is doing the breast cancer screening example. So for a population, we're going to include women that are age 40 years of age and older. So what are we excluding? Outside that age range, we don't want men. And since it's breast cancer screening, 
We're talking about average risk women, not women that have sort of a genetic predisposition or something like that. Okay, moving on to this point about critical appraisal of individual studies. So systematic reviews, this is really important, and if you don't see this, this actually is a, a huge red flag. Um, systematic reviews need to show you that of the studies that were included, they made a point of going through each one and somehow grading or evaluating how good they were. So this is an example of how one would do it. This is um, by the Cochrane Collaboration. So the Cochrane Collaboration is a group um, largely over in Europe, although there are some centers here in the U.S. as well, they're, and they're a pretty reliable and extensive source of producing systematic reviews. This is their tool for assessing what they call the risk of bias. So summarizing the quality of evidence for single studies. And so you can see what they've done here across all the different domains on which a, a, a trial in this case could have sort of fallen down um, in, its, in its performance. So here we have, you know, did they, random, did they have random sequence generation? Do they conceal allocation? Did they blind participants in outcome assessment? Was there selective reporting? And, and here's their judgment. Is it a high, low, or an unclear risk of bias? And what that ends up looking like in, in the review itself is you get this lovely little table where you get these pluses, minuses, or question marks, and it's color-coded. And what's nice about this is you can look quickly across each individual study, and you'll know right away if one of them is particularly, you know, troublesome or not. Now, what's good about this is it's trying to, to take this process and make it as objective as possible. Now, that's not to say that if I went back and I wanted to sort of replicate this, that I would produce a table that looked exactly the same as these authors. But what it is to say is it's transparent enough by doing it this way that I could immediately tell where these authors and I disagreed and we could have a rational scientific discussion about it. And that's what's so lovely about this process. It's explicit and it's transparent and we could know where we are disagreeing about it. Okay, so once they've done it for the individual studies, you also then need to do it for the entire body of evidence. That is, for each research question, once you've sort of evaluated it on the individual study level, then you have to say, okay, so overall, for everything we know about that question, how good is the evidence? What do I ultimately think? So this is one tool or method for doing that. This one's called GRADE, okay, so it's across the outcome, and again, here are the sort of factors that they're, they're rating on, and then you get to this sense of what's the overall quality of evidence. Is it high, moderate, low, very low? And here's how you judge it. There's the rating scale. There's another one that the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality uses. This is it, how they kind of do it here. This is their, what they call their evidence table. And you can see here's the research question, like key question one here. It says for, this is, a, this is one on, um, that they did on uh, comparative effectiveness of antidepressants, for example. So they say, okay, well, what about the onset of action of this drug? And here they'll say, here's the number of trials that we had, here's what we found, and the strength of the evidence could be low, moderate, high, insufficient. Pretty clear and straightforward in telling you what you know. Okay, and so why is this important? What do, why do we want to know this? So this is kind of putting this in context with what I told you before about um, needing to know about uh, conflicts of interest, so like, like a checklist that you're going down and you're trying to put all of these different points in context. So this is a study that was done that was looking at um, neuraminidase inhibitors. So those are used for the prophylaxis and treatment of acute influenza. There's been um, multiple studies done of these, but in truth, they have been the subject of some uncertainty about their specific clinical benefits, how well these work, for what outcomes, um, has been the subject of some debate. So there's been a number of systematic reviews done that have tried to sort of clear this up for people. But, so what this study did was take a look at all the systematic reviews that have been done because the systematic reviews have not come to the same conclusion. And so what they did was they said, okay, among the systematic reviews that we've seen done, some of them were done by industry or had financial conflicts of interest. Some of them did not. Now what we want to know is within them, what did they do as far as reporting out to us indicators about the quality of the studies, the quality of the evidence? And what you found here was, so this is sort of indicator number two that you're going down to help you sort of work through the disparities in the conclusions. How many of them told me about publication bias? How many told them me about the underlying ability to access study data? How many of them told me that they were, that the underlying studies were funded by a source that might have a conflict of interest. 
And you can see here that the reviews that didn't have financial conflicts of interest, many of them gave you that information. The ones that had the financial conflict of interest, only one of them did. The point is not to flog the financial conflict of interest thing here. The point is, though, if you didn't know about those other standards, about what you should be looking for, about study quality, you wouldn't have had marker two to start looking through to help you differentiate why did they have discordant results and where should I maybe start putting the weight of conclusions. I'm not telling you what, which of these reviews concluded what. What I'm trying to tell you is, now we've got two markers that we might be looking at to help us sort of sort through where the evidence might lie. If all of those reviews that gave you all the information about study quality and were not conflicted, were starting to fall out on one side, I might put more weight on understanding and, and believing in those. Okay, so now moving on to standards for findings and, and assessing the individual studies for inclusion in the report. Just a few things to talk about here. So they're saying, uh, the Institute of Medicine said you need to conduct a comprehensive and systematic search for the evidence. You should take action to address potentially biased reporting. So there they're talking about making sure you're looking through the gray literature or things that were not published, basically. That you should be screening and selecting studies. You should document your search, manage data collection, and critically appraise each study. So some of that we've already talked about. This is the most important point that I want to talk about from all of that. This is a diagram that you should make sure that you see within each systematic review. It's important that you do that. And this is coming from something that's called the uh, PRISMA statement, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So this is called the flow of information through the different phases of a systematic review. And it's showing you through each step of the systematic review process when articles are getting excluded and why. So let me show you an example of this. And this gets back to the breast cancer screening evidence report that I was talking about before. So you start with like 12,000 potential hits, which is, you know, astronomically huge. But as you work your way down through this, it, it starts to really, you know, settle out. But what the most important thing in all of this is, is look at the, 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 the second box on the right there, where it starts to show you why did things get, get thrown out, basically. So wrong population, wrong intervention, wrong outcomes wrong study design, it's really helpful to know why things are getting thrown out. And if you don't know that, you don't know whether it was appropriately excluded or not. Okay. These are the standards from the IOM for synthesizing the body of evidence. These are just a couple highlights. They're saying you should have a pre-specified method to evaluate your body of evidence. So that kind of goes without saying. And then they talk about conducting your qualitative synthesis and you should decide if you're going to do a quantitative synthesis, which is meta-analysis. And if you're going to do that, you should address if there's study heterogeneity. You should accompany your estimates with measures of statistical uncertainty. The most common of those is called the I-squared statistic. I'm not going to go into details on this. And then you should assess the sensitivity of your conclusions to changes in the protocol, assumptions, and study selection. What this means is do sensitivity analyses to see if anything would change depending on your assumptions. So that one's pretty important. Okay. Last minute or two here. So they also, in the IOM report, had standards for reporting. And interestingly, a few years before that, actually, in 2009, there was this statement that came out from what was called the PRISMA group, which were called Transparent Reporting of Systematic Reviews. And so reporting standards are different than setting up standards for how a systematic review should be performed and conducted. But they're really helpful still for all of us when we're looking at different systematic reviews and trying to determine which one might be of better quality because even though they're just reporting standards, they include with them, within them, a lot of the quality indicators that we still want to know about it. So it's really helpful to have this checklist because we can use that to take a look and say, did they hit these things? Because if they don't have them, that's a red flag for us to say this probably isn't or, we, or this probably isn't high quality, or if it is, I still can't tell, and so I'm going to put less weight on it than one that sort of meets all these markers. So it's really useful to have this PRISMA checklist with you when you're taking a look at a systematic review to say, okay, I can feel more confident about this because they did what they were supposed to do. So very quickly, this is sort of the standard stuff you should probably see in any publication, right, title, abstract, introduction. But methods are the meat, right? So we talked about almost all of these already. So going through this, is there a protocol, right? Is there a risk of bias in individual studies being measured or across studies, right? How'd they do their synthesis of results? Taking a look at the results, same kind of things. 
What kind of things did they do? Taking a look at the discussion, the summary of evidence. Did they talk about their limitations? Looking at the funding, what did they disclose? We need to know that, so we're putting that in context. All right, so finally, having talked about all of this and knowing that that um, IOM report came out in 2011, we're, and we're wondering how things are doing now and how important it is to sort of have that checklist with us wherever we go. So this was put out in 2016. And again, this is, this is sort of a convenience sample that was looked at in Medline for one month of that, trying to say, okay, so we've got these standards, we've got the PRISMA checklist, how well do systematic reviewers do on sort of meeting some of these standards? Now, this is not all of the ones that they looked at. I just tried to pull out some of the most important to see, see you know, okay, how'd they do? So how many of these were prospectively registered? That's a sort of dismal 4%, so not good. How many of them even used a protocol, which we were saying, you know, randomized controlled trials are supposed to do this, right? And these are so kind of like a corollary. So three-fourths of them didn't manage to do that. And then protocol publicly accessible, less than that, which, okay, we couldn't even get, we couldn't even get three-fourths of them to, to say what they were going to do ahead of time, so fine. How many of them used the PRISMA statement? You know, only 30% of them did that. How many of them talked about the study screening method that they, that they were using? Well, we got about two-thirds of them to do that. How many of them assessed individual studies' risk of bias? We talked about how incredibly important that was for a systematic review, and we still had more than, more than a quarter of them not doing that, right? How many of them assessed risk of publication bias? You know, 30% of, of them did that. So, how many of them incorporated the literature flow, flow diagram I was talking about? Only 70% of them did that. So you can see on most of these markers, we're really not performing at the level we need to, So, which is disappointing. But on the other hand, now you're starting to see why we might have some of these discordant results among these multiple systematic reviews that we're talking about. So I hope that this was a helpful presentation in terms of giving you some, some pretty um, concrete and pragmatic tools to help you, even if you just have one systematic review, to sort of walk through it and say, is this something that I really should be using, or is it something maybe I should put aside and move on to something else? And thanks for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions that people might have. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Croswell. Uh, very interesting presentation. We have some questions uh, that have been coming in uh, during the presentation, so let me turn to those. Um, when uh, in some of your slides you were reporting uh, that there was a conflict of interest or was not a conflict of interest, did, were it, it, in those uh, slides, did that mean that uh, there was a reporting or lack of reporting of conflict of interest, or they were definitely reporting that there was a conflict of interest? Are we talking about? Let me go back because I think. And I'm, are we I'm not going to. Uh, uh, could uh, let's go ahead and answer it for that slide. Okay. So for this one, it meant that they did disclose a conflict of interest. It doesn't necessarily mean that in the other ones, they didn't have a conflict of interest. You see what I'm saying? So it's, there could be in the ones where it said no financial COI, I mean, they can only go on what was reported in the, in the published systematic review. So that, the systematic that, review published and said, we have a financial COI that we're disclosing, that's what they got. But, you know, there's no way to uh, totally confirm that in the other ones there wasn't a COI. It could have been not disclosed. So the, the, where it says no financial COI in this slide, it really means no financial COI disclosed. That's correct. Okay, good. I, I think that answers the, the uh, listener's question. Um, what do you think explains the explosion or proliferation of systematic reviews? I was, I was shocked. If, if we're publishing 25,000 trials a year, and, and I, I, think, I think you said we're also publishing like 20 or 25,000 systematic reviews a year? Yeah. So that the number of trials that are being published is being matched now by the number of reviews that are being published. Why, why do you think that's happened? Why, why so many reviews? So one of the um, references that I included uh, with that reference list that I would strongly recommend people read because it's, it's 
great and it's interesting. Um, it was done by John Ioannidis and it was called, I want to make sure I get it exactly right, The Mass Production of Redundant, Misleading, and Conflicted Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analyses. And it was published in Millbank Quarterly like a year or two ago. And he had a number of um, thoughts about that. But some of, the, some of the reasons I think are, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on systematic reviews, and rightly so, as being um, kind of at the top of the food chain of the evidence pyramid. Because when I think, when they're done correctly and they're done well, they are um, a great, you know, they're a great source of evidence and they really should serve as the sort of pillar or foundation of clinical practice guidelines and appropriately can change clinical care. So that's, so, so they are, um, you know, they have large impact and importance. So that's one reason that people put a lot of emphasis on them. They can be published in um, high impact journal settings. They can be heavily cited. So there's a lot of forces that would move towards people wanting to do them. They're also, they use secondary data, data sources, right? They're data reuse. So they are actually fairly, in a research setting way to think about it, they're pretty cheap and relatively fast to produce. Um, so those, those, those um, also triangulate towards wanting to make more of these. But I think that also then leads to maybe people not always using them for the most, um, I don't want to say honorable purposes, but in a sense it, it leads to, to forces also saying, you know, they can be used not always in the purest way. I mean, they can be used as marketing tools, and there are companies now that exist with the sole purpose of cranking these out and not necessarily just for academic purposes. They are, you know, they can be used to sort of um, promote things as well. And so I think that sort of leads to the churn as well. So there, there are a lot of forces now at work that sort of align to, to, to sort of um, align in the direction of wanting to, to, be, to be favorable to, to producing many of them, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it does. It reminds me a little bit of the situation with subgroup analyses, um, yeah. where it's, it's easy to do lots of subgroup analyses out of a given trial, and if you do enough of them, you'll find something. And if you slice the universe of studies up, uh, I mean, you could slice the universe of studies up into lots of different pieces and do a systematic review for each of those pieces, and you end up with lots of papers on your resume. Um, well, but yes. Exactly. Yeah, not necessarily contributing in a helpful way to the to the literature. No, um, and they're and they're difficult to do, honestly. And so, you know, it can be easy for people to not necessarily realize when they start to jump into them that they maybe haven't assimilated all of the methodological expertise they probably should have before diving in. Yeah, and the one of the last slides that you showed shows very clearly that. Uh, they're not always done with high quality, and so reader beware uh, of uh, systematic reviews, just like reader beware of, of individual trial reports. Right, exactly. Yeah. Another question from our uh, uh, listeners and viewers, uh, how can the PICO statement be modified for non-health studies? This one? Um, I, 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 I think so. It, it may be... Um, I think the questioner is, is trying to understand how uh, PCOs can be applied if they're not looking at health uh, research papers. Well, I think a lot of, I mean, a lot of these criteria can still apply even if it's not specifically. So you're still going to describe the population. You're still going to describe the intervention. It may be that's an intervention right. that's that's uh, providing uh, training in uh, arithmetic skills or something. It may have nothing to do with health. You you still want to report the comparisons that you're making, the outcomes that you're using. And the outcomes and, so, and the timing yeah. and the study. Yeah. yeah. So Much the, of this would still apply. Yeah. Um, is there work? Is there any um, any group um, that is uh, acting as a clearinghouse for? Uh, systematic reviews is there is is Cochrane kind of like that is there a, 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 a and you may not want to answer this question is there a group that uh, where people can have greater faith when they're looking at a systematic review oh if it came from that source uh, 
uh, maybe I can trust it more. And I, I, as uh, I said, you may not want to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So, I mean, there are certainly groups where you'd say, I mean, there are, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this. There are groups that are well known for producing evidence reviews, and I would certainly say Cochrane is one of those. ARC is one of those. There are, you know, there's uh, um, some groups, uh, like there are a few in Canada that are no, known for those, but there really isn't, and, and this is something that the IOM brought up. They, so they had a companion document that they put out with that, um, the standards for the systematic reviews, and it was called um, like trustworthy clinical guidelines, basically. Um, and in that one, then the reason they put it out as a companion document was because one of the things they were trying to say is that the sort of touchstone or cornerstone of clinical practice guidelines should be systematic reviews. And in there, though, they said, you know, it's really difficult to sort through what should be, there's like so many clinical practice guidelines out there, and um, right now there's the National Guidelines Clearinghouse, but, you know, there's nobody is sort of, nobody's sort of saying, well, which one is the best one? And they, at that time they sort of were like, we think the National Guidelines Clearinghouse should be doing that. And the National Guidelines Clearinghouse is like, whoa, we're not touching that one with a 10-foot pole. And you, you can imagine why, because it, it can be kind of, it, it can be kind of a politically sensitive thing to sort of be like, well, I get to be the one arbitrating, you know, who, who gets to be the one setting the standards on all of this. Um, so it's really difficult. I think the other thing that's difficult about that is in terms of sort of trying to say for all of these systematic reviews coming to, out of all of these different sources, I think it would be fantastic because it's a very difficult job. What, what I'm telling you is like I'm trying to give you all these tools but it's enormously, in a sense, enormously exhaustive in terms of time and energy every time to try to say, okay, now I'm going to try to sit down for these five systematic reviews I found and sort through it and sort of figure out for myself which is the best one. That was supposed to, in a way, be the point of the systematic review. That's what I was trying to say at the beginning of this talk. And now we're in this, this sort of weird tautology where that's not happening, right? Um, but I don't know the answer to it, in a way, because... It's, it gets you right back to the problem where it's enormously expensive and it is um, challenging to figure out, well, who should that entity be who gets to guard the guards, right? So I don't, I don't have a perfect answer to that one. Are, I wish are I there, did. Yeah, are there features in systematic reviews that you can point to that you would characterize as fatal flaws? Um, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at individual trial reports, if they... Uh, didn't randomize. I, you know, big red flag goes up for me. Uh, yeah, there are I mean, other so other kinds of features. How how in in yeah, the systematic review example, world? When I can't when I can't find how they individually quality rated things or across the studies, that to me, if the, if I can't find that, I, I'm not I'm not interested in looking at it anymore because that's pretty basic, right? Um, if if I can't figure out things like the sort of like I was talking about a protocol, if I can't figure out Ahead of, like if they don't if they don't clearly lay out that they specified ahead of time and it's clear to me what their sort of criteria was for what's in and what's out and what their specific research question was, I'm not really going to look at that anymore either, because those things need to be pretty explicit up front. We have several questions about doing uh, a systematic review as opposed to evaluating systematic reviews. Uh, so, so let me ask a couple of those. Um, uh, you pointed to the grade criteria as uh, 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 some criteria that could be used to evaluate individual studies. Uh, would you point to that as, you know, one of the better uh, sets of criteria for uh, 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 evaluating uh, evidence? I mean, yeah, I think it's, I think there are several that are that are all pretty good, and I think it's you know it's it becomes a little bit a dealer's choice in a way. I think I think that grade is fine. I, you know, I, I my, as you heard, my my history is that I came from HRQ for a while, so I'm more familiar working within that sort of a, a, a model. But they're very similar, quite honestly, in a lot of ways. So I think they're both fine. 
Um, uh, one of the points on this slide that you've got uh, on the screen now is uh, study design, RCT, non-RCT. Um, there are um, uh, lively discussions uh, out there about uh, whether RCTs are the only thing that we should pay attention to or whether there are some other uh, designs that are uh, also quite good. And uh, uh, so I have a couple of questions that are related to that. W one is how you, uh, in a, as you're doing a review, how you handle uh, uh, very different kinds of study designs. So you might, you might have an a series of individually randomized trials. You might have a series of cluster randomized trials. H how do you combine the results from those rather different kinds of trials? They're, they're all randomized, but uh, they have, they're very different sorts of designs. Are there standard methods for doing that? Oh, um, that's an excellent question. You know, it, 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 it can, I think it kind of depends a little bit because, you know, it, it depends on the, on the degree of heterogeneity, whether you're going to feel like you can, you can, if you're talking about sort of a meta-analysis level, I mean, it, it, it'll depend, and I, I don't think I can give you one answer because it'll depend not only on the design of the trials, but then it'll depend on the trials themselves to say, is the heterogeneity to the point where we feel like we, can, we have to stop at a sort of qualitative level or we can sort of move on past that point. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, a, a related question. Um, there is increasing interest in uh, regression discontinuity designs. Um, these have been around for a while in some areas, but not health biomedical research. But now they're starting to pop up increasingly in biomedical research. They're not randomized. Uh, but many people would argue that they provide as good an, uh, a, a, a strong evidence for causal inference as you get out of a randomized trial. Uh, how do the people that are doing systematic reviews look at something like a regression discontinuity design? Is that an accepted element yet, an accepted design, or is that still considered uh, junkier because it's not uh, randomized? So I'll be honest that I personally don't know that much about it, but in uh, but in general, I'll say that, so yeah, I mean, so it's interesting looking at the way GRADE does this in terms of saying, you know, RCT always starts with high quality, non-RCT starts with low quality, you know, it, it gets a point taken away at baseline. And I think some people will look at that and they will say, that's why they won't like this way of evaluating evidence at baseline. And, and I'll say that it, it, is a, it is a perpetual debate. Um, and it's interesting because I, I, I really didn't want to get that much into mammography screening, but that, that, that's an area where I think it became, I don't want to talk about the specific topic, but in terms of thinking about evidence, that's where it sort of became particularly acute as we were thinking about how do you handle different study designs, particularly when you're sort of thinking about ideally we would say in that case we would have loved to, to, to say that the RCTs were giving us that, that causal um, certainty, but they're so old that we sort of felt like we, we wanted to have um, the temporality, right, that, that the observational evidence, that only that observational evidence could give us. So, so what were you going to do in that case, right? So the point being, my point being that, that I don't think that you have systematic reviewers that are um, that binary or dichotomous about how they are viewing that evidence um, because you're dealing with situations where you, the, the practicality is that you cannot because of those kind of situations. You can have the ideals of saying, well, we, we know how, we, we know that there are strengths and limitations to these different kinds of evidence, but at the same time, there are the, the, the practical considerations of what we're dealing with in terms of the, the, the context where you're, you're just going to have to sort of deal with them both and, they, and they're both going to have their limitations. So we're going to have to put them together and come up with some kind of conclusion based on that. I'm not directly answering your question, but I think what I'm trying to say is that um, I don't, I, I, what I'm trying to say is I don't think that, it, it's going to depend on the systematic reviewer you ask, but I don't think many of them are going to be as entirely rigid. And even this grade criteria is not, I think, 
as rigid as, as, as it maybe appears on its face value. Uh, but, I, but I take the point that it appears, you know, it appears fairly rigid on its face value in terms of its starting point of sort of a denigration of certain kinds of evidence. Uh, one last question before we have to close. Uh, um, is there anything new on the horizon in terms of the way that systematic reviews are, are uh, uh, conducted or, or uh, reported? Um, uh, anything that you see as a coming trend? So there are some new, th so there are some new things that I think in terms of um, a family of systematic reviews and, and, and ways that people are starting to use systematic review methods to move into other kinds of analyses that are really interesting. And so there was a, um, an editorial that was published a few years back in the appropriately titled journal Systematic Reviews by its editors, and they were kind of saying that there are these new derivative forms of reviews that were related to systematic reviews, kind of like, um, the way that biological species uh, within the same family are related to each other. I, I liked that analogy. So for example, you've got these things that are coming now that are called like rapid reviews, where you're sort of trying to do a systematic review, but in a much compressed time frame, and you're doing that by sort of truncating parts of the methodology or using new technologies, for example. Or you have these things now that are being called evidence maps, where you're using the, the search strategy of, of a systematic review, but you're trying to use a really broad research question and give things to, to people in a visual kind of way, capturing so much systematic review information, but like in one visual image, for example. Or you're doing things like what are called individual participant data meta-analyses, where instead of um, basically taking the aggregate level um, published data, you're actually going and collaborating with all the individual trilists getting the raw data from them, and you're able to really get a good look at um, the sort of uh, treatment heterogeneity and, and, and try to figure out things like sort of do different patients respond differently or are there differences in how the treatment might work depending on how it's administered or when it's administered or, the, or those sorts of things. So these things are really exciting. Um, a lot of them are kind of just emerging, and that's really what um, PCORI's research synthesis program is all about, so I feel pretty, pretty excited to be a part of that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you <laughs> thank you, Dr. Murray, and thank you to everyone who participated in, this, in today's webinar. On the Mind the Gap website, prevention.nih.gov slash mindthegap, you will find several resources for this talk, including the slides and a list of references. We will also be posting a recording of today's webinar on our website next week. You will receive an email with a link to the recording when it's available. Thank you.